there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. If yes, don't sign up for duty as an LA narcotics cop. You definitely think a monster bridge build was too heavy. And handling the carnage on Bangkok streets is only for the most faithful. Three jobs to get you committed. It takes guts and a lot of on-the-job training to be a law enforcer in a narcotics squad. And this job doesn't come much tougher than on the streets of Los Angeles, where the annual haul of confiscated drugs can be worth almost 100 million euros. Sprawling over a 1,000 square kilometres, the home of Hollywood is also infamous for its drug culture. Jeff Sarunian is a narcotics officer at the LA County Sheriff's Department with a salary of around 50,000 euros a year. Jeff has clocked up nine years working with patrolmen to locate drug dealers and couriers. In an average year, around 3,000 arrests are made for cocaine alone. The LA Sheriff's Department is the largest sheriff's department in the world, with over 8,000 officers and over 4,000 civilian employees. Today, Jeff is preparing for one of the most dangerous parts of his job, a raid on a suspected drug dealer's house. You can have all the data on a location and know everything there is to know, but there's still the unknown. And getting hurt out here where nobody really cares about you is... You don't want that to happen. From my uh, CR information, what we're gathering is that there's mid-level sales here. So they have some good quantities, hopefully. Jeff's unit Most gets the final briefing. Every year, around 150 a officers here. die nationwide in office. the line of duty. Preparation is key. Your blood pressure rises, your adrenaline starts pumping, you start getting ready to go, very much the way an athlete would get ready to start a game. And this isn't a game, it's life and death. You don't know uh, what's gonna happen. When you're approaching a residence and you're getting ready to go in, it causes you to pause for a minute. There's a series of emotions, fear certainly is uh, a big one. Time for action has come. Crowd control is vital in case there's a shootout. Go, ahead, go, ahead, go about your business, go home, do whatever you gotta do. Okay? You don't want innocent bystanders caught in crossfire. Every part of the residence is checked for drugs. The inside of the house is unremarkable. Very bare, very uh, basic. They got just with the their bare bones uh, rifle. The gun could be valuable evidence, but so far, no drugs have been found. Then, Jeff's expert eye locates the jackpot. Okay, you have several grams. It's about a couple 20, close to 30 grams. And this is what they weigh and portion out the quantities with. People kill for this quantity of cocaine. It was a good day. Job satisfaction comes from knowing that one more dealer could be off the streets. It's such a huge money-making operation. Everybody that's involved in narcotics profits from narcotics. Jeff's job would be nothing without his colleagues who work the front line, clamping down on drug users and witnessing deals out on the streets. 
Frank Montoya is a patrol officer. Do this job and you could stand to earn around 55,000 euros a year. You'll need to be good with people and with the gun. Each night, patrol officers like Frank face danger. Uh, walk over here. Yeah, do me a favor, just grab your seat. You guys in the car, put your hands up. This is a home of Crips and Bloods and several hundred types of gangs. And this is what I do for a living. You could say it's very busy and it's dangerous, but you know, I'm adrenaline. I like adrenaline. And... Stop, get on your knees. All right, put your hands on your head. Don't move. Slowly back away. Or back In the USA, there are nearly 200 million privately owned guns. With that many firearms around, even something that looks innocent could turn nasty. Uh, that guy is harmless. When I did search him, I did find a knife, but it's no violation to have just a pocket knife. So I, I let him go, but, you know, night's still young. All right, put your hands right there, dude. Got any the next person on? Frank stops, however, is not so innocent. Yeah. No probation for You sure? You're walking down the middle of the street? He was walking down the middle of the street, and he looked like he was under the influence, which he is. I searched him for a possible uh, substance that, you know, he might be under the influence. This is PCP, right, Holmes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. PCP, or fencyclotin, also known as angel hey, dust, you, are you gonna be can make cool users feel dazed and me, chilled you out. Me get you, like, the they can suddenly become department? aggressive. No, you okay? How long have you been smoking uh, PCP? Well, how'd you ingest it? Did you, did you like drink it or what? Frank needs to be able to understand the effects of okay? many different drugs yeah. common on these streets. He's, he was arrested, you know, for his under the influence violation, but he's going to be charged for a felony possession of a controlled substance. So, it's back to the station to seal the confiscated PCP in an evidence bag in the narco box. In the drugs game, it's the police scientist who gets the last word. He verifies what the substance is and confirms that it is indeed illegal. The most common drugs that we test are cocaine powder and also cocaine rock, or the base form, and methamphetamine. First thing I do is take a little bit of the white powder, and we're going to add some chemicals to do what are called color screening tests. They just help give you an idea of what you might have. Cocaine stains blue with this test because of a compound that it forms with the chemical reagents. This is a good indication that drug evidence will stand up in court and improve the odds of eventually achieving a conviction. Now they're starting to shoot at somebody right now. Frank is still out in Compton, working his 15 square kilometer patch. With five years police training and more than 10 years on the job, he knows to expect the worst. It's a drive-by shooting. Frank was now called on his caring side to help the injured and calm an increasingly agitated crowd. I think the, the two victims were standing in this area and two of the rounds struck here and here. Yeah, when it comes to crime, and especially violent crime, Compton's pretty high up there. We saw uh, two you know, Hispanic youths. Uh, one of them was shot nine times, the other one was shot uh, a couple times. I guess apparently it was a drive-by shooting from a rival gang. I think one of the boys died. It bothers me because I have a young son, he's 11 years old. I could never think of him doing something like that. If I didn't have hope, I wouldn't be doing this job, but I do it because I love it. will still be there when he clocks on tomorrow night. Cops aren't the only ones that carry the burden of saving lives. Being a paramedic in Bangkok is heavy duty, but first... We 
move 11,000 kilometers east to Greece. They gave us theatre and democracy. Now the Greek people are about to give us another world first. Straddling the entrance to the Corinthian Gulf, this is the largest and most ambitious building project ever undertaken by the Greek authorities. Spanning 2,252 metres, the Rio Anterio Bridge. Yeran Mui is the crane operator. The money's not bad, around 30,000 euros a year. But you'll need at least five years on the job to get that. I consider myself to be a seaman and not a crane driver. I do drive the crane, but I really see myself as being a seaman. Yeru is one seaman with unusual footwork. He is in control of laying massive road sections onto the new bridge. The job looked deceptively easy, with three joysticks to move the crane in three dimensions. He's trained a foot to be a third hand. But this rough trade gets even more unusual because this crane is actually a boat. The difficulty is to stay focused because you've got many different handles and all the winches have to turn on the right time with the right speed. I think the worst case scenario for me is making a mistake with one of the winches and getting somebody injured is the, yeah, the worst case scenario. Because this mammoth structure floats, just a single wave could nudge the crane out of control. And if you like your nine to five, then this job is definitely not for you. The team is on a tight deadline. Waking up at 4.30 in the morning isn't exactly the best thing in the world, but it's worth it working on the biggest bridge in the world. The crane is 72 metres high and can lift over a million kilos. Dangers of lifting weights like this are obvious. Before Yeroon can take the helm, he must get a weather report. A sudden change in the sea's currents or a gust of wind could be catastrophic. Three South 09 on M3 today. 300 and... Yeah, understood. The forecast is good, and it's all systems go. So, no wind, no current. Shouldn't be much of a problem today. But there is one major complication. They're working in a high-risk earthquake zone, and that requires ultra-specialised engineering. It will be able to withstand a 180,000 tonne tanker smacking into it at a rate of 18 knots. This is one bridge built with disaster in mind. It's the end of another shift for Yeru. With four new road sections in place, it's time to head below deck. This crane has another secret. It's also a floating hotel. We've got a, a place where we eat, the, there's a bar. Everybody normally got his own bedroom. There's even a sauna. It's almost like a, a normal home. You'll need at least one foreign language to work here, as this is a totally international team. Roger Seablo is the boss. A construction engineer in his position can earn around 50,000 euros a year. His job is to make sure that each part of the construction is carried out to exacting standards. A freelance engineer like Roger can be responsible for overseeing anything. Roads, dams, skyscrapers and of course bridges. La hauteur du pont, les piles les plus hautes sont des piles de 230 mètres. Les quatre piles du bridge sont de 230 mètres de haut, 165 mètres sous l'eau et 65 mètres au-dessus. La longueur du bridge est de 2 km. Les ingénieurs willing to start on the bottom rung must have at least a bachelor's degree.
For Roger, this project is made even more huge by the seismic activity in this area. There are real problems with earthquakes here every month, measuring three and a half to four and a half on the Richter scale. We have to make sure the infrastructure is right, so the bridge is earthquake resistant. Worldwide, there are over 6,000 quakes every year, registering four on the Richter scale. Although not devastating, they can do structural damage. Roger's team checks the supports are ready for Yeroun's sections of road. Bolting a bridge together can be a hazardous job at the best of times. Just imagine doing it at the top of these 160 metre high pillars. Enter the specialists. Time to hand over to the bridge rope plumbers. To do this job, you need to be part engineer, part mountaineer. The task today is to connect giant steel cables to the top of the pillars to hold the new road sections in place. The cables are designed to act as huge shock absorbers in the event of an earthquake. Up here you run the risk of getting used to the height and the danger and you become careless and don't look out for yourself anymore. That's when you start risking your life. It's a tough job, but it has a major perk. We are seasonal workers, so we have six months of drudgery, then three or four months on vacation. You can't do such a risky job the whole year round. Even for an expert climber, if a harness breaks or a cable slips, it's a long way down. Daredevils need not apply, as this work demands a high regard for safety. These cables will help take the strain of the 25,000 cars per day estimated to use the bridge. Construction is always a joint effort. Remember, there's no I in team. Next day, before dawn, crane operator Yeroun is back in the hot seat as a new section of bridge needs lifting. His joystick skills make it look easy, but this is not a job for people who can't do commitment. How about this for responsibility? All you've got to do is pick up the wounded from the streets and ferry them back to the hospital before they die. Interested? You might change your mind when you see what the job entails in downtown Bangkok, Thailand's capital. Wave Sirin is a volunteer paramedic. In this city, saving other people's lives can potentially reduce your own life expectancy. Incredibly, Wave is a well-known soap star by day, but by night, he's an angel of mercy. Bangkok has a population of 8 million. As a paramedic here, Wave has to double as a rally driver and sometimes an undertaker. In Thailand, Road fatalities are the third biggest killer after AIDS and heart attacks. A call comes in that a bus and motorcyclist have collided. The moment you get an emergency call, every second counts. It's a race against time and death. And if you're lucky, you win. Bangkok's yearly death toll is over 800, with 22,000 injuries from around 50,000 accidents. And paramedics can get injured attending to accidents. But Wave believes his mission's actually protect him from danger. But then again, maybe he's just a good driver. At the scene of the accident, it's not looking good. Wave's not a doctor, and in Bangkok, 
Paramedics like him usually receive only a few months medical training. Trained or not, it appears that this time he's too late. It's procedure to take the victim to hospital to verify the cause of death. As the ambulance picks its way through the narrow streets, Wave gets a surprise. This man is far from dead. After shot from trauma, it can make a person wake up violently. But any internal injuries will only be complicated if the victim struggles. Wave shouts to his driver to speed up and radio the hospital to receive the injured man. This time, Wave didn't need his specialist training in first aid, spinal immobilisation and bleeding control. But it was an unforgettable job. This type of night happens quite regularly. People drink, they get into trouble. But this has never happened before. Someone coming around like that gave me a real front. With the injured biker safely in the emergency room, Wade has to inform headquarters which hospital the victim has been admitted to, so that the relatives can find him. As nursing shortages get worse, volunteer paramedics are increasingly on the front line of healthcare. But it seems he can't quite shake off the day job. One of Wave's fans approaches for an autograph. Unlike the horror he encounters on the streets, where he must make lightning decisions about life and death, his well-rehearsed day job can be repeated until they get it right. And when the curtain falls, Wave is back in the fast lane. It's another motorbike accident, but this time it really is fatal. Working in this job means learning to keep your emotions in check. According to Buddhist beliefs, all the victim's possessions must be collected for enjoyment in the next life. Unlike many religions, Buddhism does not accept the existence of the soul, but believes simply in the existence of the body and the mind. At death, the mind will leave the physical body behind, which decays, leaving the mind free to pass into the next life. Risky territory. Do you really want to get into the question of mind versus soul? Wave believes that by helping the injured and the dead, he gains good karma. If he were to take his skills abroad as a paid paramedic in the US, with experience, he could possibly earn around 50,000 euros a year. For now, he'll stick to being an unpaid volunteer in Bangkok. I think you're the type to make it through medical training with a wallet and a heart big enough to do it all for nothing. Surely goes to the Bangkok paramedic.